This video is part of a series of presentations covering the key concepts of virtualizations and its application to cloud computing. This specific presentation covers the details of creating and running a simple GNU Linux virtual machine using QEMU. QEMU is a Type 2 hypervisor. It is a machine emulator and a virtualizer. It is free and open source, so you can freely download and use it. As a machine emulator, QEMU can emulate different kinds of CPUs or machines. So the CPU can be Intel, ARM, AMD, so it can emulate different kinds of CPUs. And it uses dynamic instruction translation to dynamically translate the host instructions to the instructions on the native CPU. Because of this, when used as a virtualizer, QEMU achieves near native performance because to the maximum extent possible, the guest code directly runs on the host CPU. So most of the safe instructions are directly executing on the guest code and only a few of the special or unsafe instructions are managed by QEMU, the virtualizer. QEMU provides a simple command line interface, so it's easy to set up different kinds of options and parameters. So the command can be run either as part of a web page startup, so you can run these commands through a web page by forking and executing the different commands. You can use an existing kernel to set up what are known as containers or very lightweight virtual machines. And there are applications like Docker that uses these containers for automating some of the software development processes. And you can use different kinds of disk images with QEMU, and you can convert disk images back and forth. So QEMU is a very versatile and pretty widely used Type 2 hypervisor. Let's look at an example run of using QEMU, and we'll dig into the details of some of these commands that we will use. So here QEMU is running a Linux kernel, and the Linux kernel starts up. We have set up networking on QEMU, so it sets up the IP address. And now you're working inside a virtual machine. It, here we're running a Linux virtual machine. And once you're done, you reboot it. It drops you back to the host operating system's terminal prompt. In this presentation, we are going to go into some of the details of how these uh, instructions work and what they accomplish. Keep in mind the objective is to get a high-level overview and not to delve into too many of the details. These commands you can always copy paste and get it to work. Here we're just trying to get a high level understanding of what these operations do. So when running with QEMU you need two key artifacts. One is of course the operating system or the kernel image. This is the kernel that's going to boot and start running. Here the kernel can be compiled from an existing from source so you can download the kernel source code and compile it. There are tons of videos on uh, the internet showing you how to compile a Linux kernel. But here we'll just use an existing compiled kernel just to save time. QEMU includes a generic BIOS and a bootloader, so it will directly be able to boot the kernel. A second thing that it requires, this is actually a kernel requires, is a disk image, uh, also called a archive. So it's like a zip file that contains all of the files that you would like for the kernel to be able to work with. So the disk image includes all of the programs and tools that you would like to run on your virtual machine. Uh, this disk image will be used by the kernel as the root of the uh, Linux's virtual file system. And the disk image is, is an in-memory image. That means whatever changes you make to the disk, these changes are not permanent, so once you turn off the virtual machine, they'll be lost. So that is something that you have to keep in mind. There are different ways you can work with a more permanent storage, though, with QEMU. So this is how you create a uh, archive. So you uh, find all of the files you want to put into your archive, and there's a command called CPIO that creates a special kind of archive. So archive here is like a zip file that contains all of these uh, files that you want to be associated with your virtual machine. So when you run QEMU, a very simple way to run it is you specify the kernel that you want to boot, and you specify the disk image you want to use. And once you have both of these artifacts, you it'll basically start the uh, virtual machine for you. But typically, you will add a lot more options and command line arguments to QEMU to configure it and set up a broad range 
of uh, devices and such. We'll go over some of the examples in this presentation. For example, let's say you run QEMU without a disk image. Here, the kernel will still boot. Uh, it'll start up, it'll boot, and then once the kernel will boots up, it needs the root of the virtual file system. It'll panic to say, hey, I'm not able to find the root of the virtual file system, and it'll stop. Only thing you can do is, at that time, just quit out of QMU, because without the disk image, the kernel will not move forward. So we need to create a disk image for using of, to run our uh, virtual machine. So here, disk images are essentially file systems with the data associated with it. So this includes any programs, uh, images like pictures or videos, and any configuration files that you want to be available on your virtual machine. And the disk image is mounted as a root or slash of Linux's virtual file system, and that is the one that is used by the kernel once it starts running. The disk image is typically zipped and compressed to ease distribution. So when you look at some of these distributions, what you see is the zipped and compressed form. And the content and the program of these disk images can vary. Different GNU Linux distributions choose different content. So Red Hat would have a different disk image. Fedora would have a different disk image. Mint OS will have a different disk image. Arch Linux will have a different disk image. But keep in mind, all of these are just different combinations of the programs. The core tools and software are all the same. That means everybody is reliant on GCC. Uh, everybody is reliant on the Linux kernel. Everybody is compiling pretty much the same set of GNU tools. It's just that what additional software that you want to be available is what the choices are for the different distributions. And of course, you know, they use different color color settings and pictures and such to customize graphical desktops, so on and so forth. But other than those customization in terms of colors and pictures, the information in all of these different distributions is about the same. Here in this presentation, we'll look at a simple disk image where we'll create a custom Linux distribution our disk image will not use a will include a kernel. We'll just use an existing kernel on the Linux machine, and we'll create it uh, as a what's known as a CPIO archive, which is very similar to the file system used on CD-ROMs. And then to create our Linux distribution, we'll use a special program called BusyBox, and we'll take a look at BusyBox and why we are using BusyBox for our uh, distribution. BusyBox is a very versatile standalone software that can mimic many standard Linux programs. They are not fully featured, so you get a few of the key features of each one of the different Linux commands that we have used. It is a standalone program, so it does not rely on any other library, so all you need to include in your disk image would be BusyBox, and it'll be able to run by itself on a standard Linux uh, kernel. It's very compact. It's only about 1.2 megabytes. So with 1.2 megabytes, you can create like hundreds of different Linux commands. These are not fully featured, but you'll be able to get the core basic features of these commands. Uh, BusyBox can also serve as init. Remember, init is the first program that's run by the kernel. So BusyBox can also work as init. And when it runs as init, it'll also perform certain customizations that are specified in the Etsy RCS uh, shell script. And we'll look at the Etsy RCS shell script in a little bit detail. BusyBox can emulate hundreds of standard Linux commands, so you'll get all of the standard Linux commands like ls, rm, copy, telnet, ssh. It even includes a web server, a simple web server. So it is a very, very versatile and compact program. So commands that can be set up by creating hard or soft links. So typically we use uh, soft links or symlinks. So you'll use the ln command to create these symlinks. So here is an example of creating a uh, symlink to the ls command. Yes, it is running BusyBox, but when it's run through these links like ls, BusyBox behaves as if it is the ls command. So let's take a quick overview of how a disk image is created using BusyBox. First, of course, you have to create, you would start at some directory in your host operating system, and you will create the top level directories that's used by VFS. So you'll have a pretty standard bin, dev, etsy, live, mount, proxys, USR, var. These are all very standard top level directories that you will need in any VFS distribution. 
then you will copy busybox into the bin directory and then create links to busybox so here uh, it shows creating a link to the init uh, um, program that is required by the linux kernel so here init is a link to busybox and then you will also create entries for um, the RCS, which is like a simple shell script or startup script, and we'll take a look at RCS, uh, the details of the RCS script next. Then you'll create a bunch of convenience links for various commands that you want. So you'll create links to like ls, cp, cat, grep. There are like hundreds of commands that BusyBox can run, so you can pick and choose how many ever commands you want to create links to. And even if you don't have these links now, in your virtual machine, you can create those links as needed. So it's not a big deal if you forget a few links here. Once you create all of these links and files, you create your archive by running uh, the CPIO command. So the find.print0 lists all of the files recursively. And you pipe the list of files to CPIO, which then takes all of the files and creates a um, disk image called disk.cpio. Typically, when you work with uh, QEMU, it's nice to have networking because that's one of the key features of most virtual machines. You want them to be able to interact with the internet. QEMU and BusyBox can work in collaboration to, sim to set up a simple network uh, virtualization hardware. So you, to run this, you do not require any root or pseudo privileges on the host machine, so you can run it on any machine. However, if you do have root privileges on the host, then you can configure a more comprehensive or complete network hardware. So here's an example of how you would set up that networking uh, with uh, QEMU. Um, so you will have two options. One is called the device, which specifies the hardware device that we want to virtualize. In this case, I'm just going to pick E1000, which is a very generic gigabit or a thousand megabit network. And the device number logically that we're going to associate is user zero for it. A second one that you need to do is NetDev, which tells QEMU to forward the TCP port uh, 80 from the virtual machine that it's going to create to the host port number 8080. So it enables any data. So if you run a web server on your virtual machine at port 80, the traffic will flow from there onto port 8080 on your actual physical machine and then onto the internet. So let's make sure we understand this a little bit. Remember, we are running a, a host machine. The host operating system is running, inside which we are going to run QEMU. Inside QAMU, we are going to run a virtual machine. Inside the virtual machine, we might run a web server. And the web server might want to interact with the internet. And the question is, how do you make this interaction happen? So what we do is we take port number uh, 8080. This is just a randomly chosen port. You could pick up any port instead of 8080 on the host. You pick up any port that's available. And we want to tie it to port 80 inside the virtual machine. Inside your virtual machine, you would typically use port 80 because that's a virtual machine. No other software should be running. And a web server should typically talk on port 80. And then QEMU does the necessary work to establish the connections between them. And the data can flow. In your virtual machine, it appears it's writing to port 80. But QEMU then takes the data, pushes it to port 80, 80 on your host machine, which is then connected. Which, through which it can talk to the internet. So that's how these commands are set up. Keep in mind, QEMU uh, emulates a network interface card or the hardware. We still need to set up Linux drivers and such on our virtual machine. Uh, keep in mind, the Linux kernel requires device drivers and software in order to if, uh, interact and work with this hardware. This is what happens, or these are the commands that are placed in the Etsy init or RCS file. This is the file that's run by the init uh, when it starts up. So here, we first use BusyBox to do the different operations. Here we say BusyBox insert a module. This is a kernel mod, which is the device driver. So it loads the kernel module. Here we are specifically using E1000 kernel module because we are trying to emulate an E1000 NIC, so we, that's the device driver for it, so we're loading the device driver. Once we load the device driver, it creates the entry for Ether0, which is the default Ethernet device. So we tell ifconfig, uh, busybox to work as ifconfig, and bring up or start up the Ethernet so the networking stack starts up. 
then we have to get a uh, IP address associated with our machine. Here, BusyBox interacts with QEMU. QEMU has a built-in DHCP server. So here we get or request an IP address to be associated with our Ethernet device. And then we also set up routing for all of the packets. And then finally, we tell BusyBox to route all of the packets onto QEMU's default gateway. And that IP address is fixed to 10.0.2.2. So any data that goes on one of our uh, virtual machines will be routed to QEMU's default gateway, which then pushes the traffic onto port 8080 from the virtual machine. So this is these are all configurations that's done inside the virtual machine to load the necessary device drivers to interface and work with the network interface card, which is a virtual hardware device that is emulated by QEMU. Once it's set up, the network QEMU starts up and runs like we looked at earlier in this presentation. So when we work on the cloud computing and cloud computing infrastructures, they usually provide user interfaces that streamline running all of these commands that we looked at when working with QEMU. So they may not use QEMU, they might use different types of uh, virtualization hypervisors, but they all run these kinds of commands at the command line, and these web UIs or other user interfaces like VirtualBox and such streamline running these commands on behalf of the user. And of course, uh, once the virtual machine is running, a lot of these statistics are pulled from slash proc, whatever is the, notice that it's a type two hypervisor, it has a process ID. So the stat file from that PID pulls all the CPU IO operations and the statistics are used for plotting charts and of course to calculate cost of running these virtual machine for billing operations and such. Let's do a summary. QEMU is a type two hypervisor that runs at the command line. It eases running virtual machines. QEMU requests two key artifacts, a kernel. In this one, we used a pre-compiled kernel. And it, QEMU also requests a disk image for use with VFS. We created our own disk image here by creating symlinks into a special program called BusyBox. And of course, we also did a more detailed review of how the basic networking setup is done. Keep in mind here, the objective was just to understand the concepts and key ideas and not to necessarily memorize these commands and steps. But if you need these commands and steps, they are in the presentation. And I'll also place links to the CPIO archive um, in the uh, message after this video.